Have a medical question? Our panel of doctors will try to answer it. It's the popular Ask Anything program tonight on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening, and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. I'm Dr. Andrew Ellsworth, your Prairie Doc this evening. It has been a while since we've tackled an Ask Anything program. It is always a good evening, and there are lots of great questions from our viewers. But first, a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. It's a true or false question tonight. You, you may be charged for a COVID-19 vaccination depending upon your insurance. True or false? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a copy of the book, The Picture of Health. Each of Dr. Holmes' essays, originally written for On Call with Prairie Doc, comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. We answer your questions about, well, anything medical as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight in the studio is Dr. John McAravey who practices family medicine at Brown Clinic in Watertown, South Dakota. And remotely via Zoom is Dr. Jason Knudsen, who practices family medicine at Monument Health Spearfish Clinic in Spearfish, South Dakota. Welcome, Dr. McAravey. John, you. so glad to have you here. Jason, so here. glad to have you as well. Two good friends of mine and fellow family docs. Yeah, privilege. Um, John, if you don't mind, uh, give us a little bit about your background. Yeah, I grew up on a family farm outside of Crook, South Dakota. Tri-Valley uh, was a school I went to and then uh, did undergrad at Augustana College in Sioux Falls, much like yourself. Woohoo! Go on, go. Go! go. <laughs> um, and then I went on to the University of South Dakota School of Medicine and then to uh, Center for Family Medicine for Residency in Sioux Falls. So, um, uh, kind of joked with the medical students we talked to is I enjoy my family in the state of South Dakota and being around, so it's an opportunity to train and we have great facilities here in the state so um, kind of a local yokel but appreciate it so good good and uh, Jason if you wouldn't mind sharing us a little bit about uh, your background sure mine's uh, somewhat similar to John's I grew up in Custer South Dakota um, went to Augustana as well we got the trifecta <laughs> going I guess um, and then went to medical school at uh, USD and did residency in Rapid City and been in Spearfish now for 17 years, I think. Great, great. And Jason, you know, there are several fires around you right now. I hope uh, in Spearfish, uh, how are you guys doing there? So far, so good. Uh, Rapid City in the central southern hills has been hit a little harder. Um, there's a fire north of us up by Bison and Buffalo area, but um, in the northern hills, knock on wood, we're okay so far. You know, it does seem like fire season is a just part of life now, especially West River and in, in the mountains, but sometimes we can smell it over here on the east side too. Um, would you tell us how that can affect people with, with lung disease and what can they do to help? Sure, yeah, we, we see it uh, here especially, and I'm sure you guys do as well, but every, every summer, um, even if there aren't fires in the hills, they are burning uh, west of us uh, in the Rocky Mountains or Canada even, and that smoke gets into the upper atmosphere and travels you know, with the jet stream. And so we will often have our, our patients that have lung problems, whether asthma or emphysema, um, struggling with uh, more difficulty breathing when, uh, when we have all that smoke in the air. Um, thankfully this year we haven't had it so much yet, but it's coming. Yeah. 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 It's just a matter of being prepared. I'm sure. Um, I don't know if you ever recommend that patients have, uh, uh something set up, uh, in case they need to evacuate quickly and what you might recommend putting in that bag. 
<laughs> yeah, that is something uh, you can find uh, good resources that will help you, you know, plan an evacuation um, bag or, or a go bag. Um, you know, typically you want to know where your medicines are for sure. Uh, if you're on prescription medicines, um, any any important legal documents. Um, it's nice if you can um, take a quick video before you leave, uh, just to kind of remember what's around there. But it, it really depends on on how much time you have. Um, for some of the folks in Rapid City, they had a few minutes to leave the house and and grab what they could. So. Planning ahead does help, uh, but sometimes, you know, the, the best made plans. Right. Yeah, it just kind of goes back to the Boy Scout motto. I don't know if we have any fellow scouts here, too, tonight, but uh, uh, to be prepared. Um, so it, it's an Ask Anything show, and we've got some, some questions coming in already. Uh, here's one, and I'll ask you, John. A, a viewer has a father and grandfather that had dementia, Alzheimer's, and she is concerned about getting this. What can she do to avoid getting it? And what are the early warning signs for it? Well, um, so you know, I use the line regularly, you, you can't fix your genetics, or you can't pick your parents, so to speak. And so the genetic piece is what it is. Um, I, I think your brain is a powerful muscle. So like anything, you, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so I think just being active and engaged, and I've seen that with some of my patients this year, is isolation's been really tough on some of those folks. And so um, I, I think a lot of people take it for granted, just simple interaction with other people. Um, you can go as far as being aggressive, word puzzles, Sudoku, I mean, different things, yeah. um, kind of exercising that brain, so to speak. But I think sometimes just socializing and playing cards with your friends is, is a great option and so um, you know there's anecdotal evidence you know I've heard things about different herbal type things but I don't really have any scientific basis for anything to be honest uh, you know I, I have a very low threshold that folks have concerns um, to do some testing and there are some neuropsychological testing you can do to kind of give you some a peace of mind or say oh maybe there is a little something here there are some medication options that can help slow the progress and good, bad, or otherwise, some of those are better than others. And so I, I encourage folks, if they have issues, talk with their provider. First things first, make sure there's not a medication. Make sure there's not an electrolyte imbalance. Make sure there's not something organic that we can find otherwise. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, if we're not, we're striking out with other causes, then certainly some testing and some medication may be in order. Yeah. And I might add, you know, preventative care is important too, you know, making sure your blood pressure is under control, mm -hmm. your cholesterol, because there could be little strokes mm -hmm. that can cause dementia. Um, or if someone is, like you said, if there's a medical reason, if there's an infection or a urinary tract infection, yep. that can cause confusion or dementia-like symptoms. Mm -hmm. And, yep, and uh, so things to, to check over with your doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, this caller asks, I had West Nile a while back. And ever since, my joints have been hurting and have never gotten back to normal. Uh, Jason, do you have any advice for them? And sorry to put you on the spot with that one. No, that's all right. Um, yeah, you know, we, we you know, prior to COVID, saw West Nile a lot uh, in the summertime and, and had to deal with some of those ramifications. Um, I'm not aware that there's any specific treatments for that. Uh, there's certainly options uh, both over the counter and prescription that could be explored. Um, but it would kind of depend on the patient's other medical conditions uh, as to what medications would be the safest. So uh, I would say, short answer, there, there is things that would help, but it's probably best to talk with your physician or provider about what that would be for you. Yeah, you know, it, it, uh, it, it it's easy to, to wonder if it could be West Nile still, but uh, you know, as far as that triggered it, but um, you know, we definitely want to look into other possible causes, I, I suppose too. Um, John, does nutrition have any impact on hair loss, and what is the best remedy for hair loss? Oh wow! Um, <laughs> so the easy answer is nutrition plays a role in everything, and so I think depending on how poor or how good the nutrition is, so if, depending on resources, et cetera. So, um, you know, rarely does the American Western diet lack. You know, most of us, it's excess is our biggest issue, but there are certain 
whether it's fad diets, whether it's economic issues, different things that can lead to deficiencies. And so um, a lot of times it's hard to track those down. And so sometimes it's just doing a good uh, interview with the patient and saying, okay, are there some deficits? Are there some unique things in the diet that we can address? Um, multivitamins type things, usually there's some basic things that way. Um, sometimes there are some odd, weird things that you can go digging for. Um, thyroid's the most common thing that would cause some hair loss. Um, otherwise, hormones, post or post, um, postpartum is also a big time we hear about that. Um, in general, though, if you've otherwise healthy and all of a sudden you have a sudden change in hair, to me, that's a red flag to go looking for a gremlin somewhere because mm -hmm. normally that doesn't change dramatically. Now, we all kind of lose a little hair as we get older, et cetera. Um, but if it's a fairly dramatic change, usually that's not a sudden issue. And so it would tip you off that you should probably be looking for something. And we can always refer to dermatology, too. Sometimes they'll do some, some specific testing for it, but sometimes it is more of an or organic underlying issue. If someone has just regular hereditary or male pattern baldness, you know, they're starting to lose their hair. Is there anything you sometimes prescribe or recommend for we them? We can do a little bit of finasteride as the generic, the Propecia that people have heard about. And, and plus or minus, I do think that helps hold hair a little bit. Um, sometimes we look for testosterone deficiency as another one potentially for, for a male pattern. Um, otherwise, it's some of it is just genetic and just embrace it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this patient says they tore their ACL, their MCL, February 21st, and they've been in a full leg brace, but still have aching and muscle spasms. Is this normal? Jason, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, well, I would hope that they've seen somebody for that um, and have some, some sort of care with, with that. Um, yeah, anytime uh, a limb is immobilized like that and not, not moving quite as freely as it normally would, it's, it's going to potentially be sore. Um, I think that would potentially be something that would, would need to be explored a little bit because it would depend where that tenderness is. Um, there, there'd be some, some potential medical issues that would be concerning uh, when a, a leg is immobilized. So um, pain in the back of the calf or you know things that would be Concerning for a blood clot uh, would certainly be something that needs to be uh, evaluated, you know, pretty emergently um, or urgently. Um, but if it's more generalized muscle achiness and that sort of thing, that should be something um, that you could potentially work out with uh, the provider that you're seeing and or the physical therapist uh, to see if you can get some regimen to help with that. Yeah, very good. Yeah, it. Uh... It, it just, you know, something to talk about with your doctor, if there's some treatments that can do to, do to help for sure. Absolutely. Um, uh, John, this patient mm -hmm. asked about what about, what causes edema? So we got a very broad range Rufta. here. <laughs> and, and what can, how can I prevent it? Um, so edema, Again, if it's a sudden change, is worrisome that is there something else going on as a cause. Um, and we're talking about swelling of the legs, typically. Exactly. And, and so, I mean, most times as we age, depending on, you know, I joke a lot of times, Easter dinner, we all have a smoked ham and hash brown cheesy potatoes, and everyone comes in swollen the next day because they had way too much salt in their diet. So dramatic changes for most of us, salt um, just causes us to retain fluid and, and can be yeah. part of that. Um, Movement is, is excellent, and so being up and moving, is, is being sedentary is, is part of that. And so getting up, your, your, your veins are, are made to work with motion, and so we want you up moving um, is probably the best way to help with that. Um, compression socks, whether it be medical grade or even just a, a basic, or there's lots of options now for those support hose type stuff uh, for men and women. So some compression definitely can help prevent it. Um, and worst case, sometimes we end up using diuretics or medicine to help with that. Well, like water um, pills and yep. stuff. So, yeah. um, so there are options we can treat medically if we need, but if we can certainly prevent it, um, getting those legs up just simply. And, you know, I, I argue with a lot of people sitting in a recliner does not count as getting your legs up. It has, you have to get those feet and ankles up above the level of your heart. And so um, some of that is the devil's in the details a little bit yeah. there. You know, it might warrant uh, some tests for your heart in mm -hmm. case there's a heart failure going on. Exactly. Um, you know, if, if there's swelling on one side of the body, that's more mm -hmm. concerning typically. Mm -hmm. And so we're getting that looked into. But yeah, such a wide variety. Mm -hmm. And in, in the end, a lot of times, it, even though there's, there's swelling, you know, like in pregnancy, mm -hmm. you, you can get leg swelling. Yep. But we recommend drinking more water yeah. in those situations. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, wide 
wide range of causes. It's definitely worth the conversation with your provider if it's out of your norm or has changed dramatically, definitely to look, look yeah. further. Many of us enjoy gardening, but we may not always realize that the fruits of our labor are way more than just a harvest. Brookings Master Gardener Perry Johnson shares his feelings about what the garden means to him. Well, for me personally, I, I like being outdoors. I, I like the exercise. I, um, when I garden, I, I'm intense. Um, I dig, I crawl on my hands and knees, I pull weeds. I'm lugging water and hoses. Um, it, for me, it's, it's a great way to be outside and be physically active. I have a lot of self-esteem that I get from my product of my garden. I like to learn as much as I can about gardening and in many different areas of gardening, basically all the way from starting with uh, tapping maple trees in the late winter all the way through to harvesting my pumpkins, kind of the A to Z there. The mental health areas of gardening is, it kind of helps you self-actualize that um, Dr. Maslow talks about in his levels of needs from a mental health standpoint, it gives me a community. I, I wouldn't have been connected with uh, McCoy Gardens here or with other master gardeners. We, we have a sense of community together that we talk. I also sit at a booth during the farmer's market when there's no COVID <laughs> <laughs> virus. It's interesting to just see someone walk by and they kind of look at us and I just say, hey, how's your garden doing? And they come over and they talk and talk and talk and we have that sense of community, which is wonderful. When I was in SDSU here as a student during my, my freshman year, I got to go on this human relations trip with, with one of the churches and we went from reservation to reservation in, in trying to increase our, our knowledge of the Native American culture. Well, we stopped at Mount Rushmore, and of course, you do when you're out there. Ben Black Elk was the fifth face at Mount Rushmore. And uh, he would dress up in the cultural gown and, and allow people to take pictures of him. And he, and he interacted with the, the crowds that came in. Um, they asked him to talk. He said that if you want to listen to God, go to the brook and listen to the needles brush in the wind. Listen for the birds and the hummingbirds coming through. Those are voices, uh, spiritual voices for me. One of the master gardener training I was at, the person said, why don't everyone have an apple tree in their backyard? And I thought, well, that's really a good idea. <laughs> and so I've been promoting apple tree with the third grade group here at, in the school. Last year, I gave away 32 bare root apple trees for them to go home and plant. And that's so rewarding, you know, uh, seeing youth get involved. and understand the importance of horticulture in our life. I can't imagine this world without being green at least, you know, six months out of the year. Well, thanks so much, Perry. That's a great message uh, there. And uh, just, you know, getting outside in general and, and working with the earth. And, you know, I've even heard of stories of um, how it can be beneficial to be barefoot mm -hmm. and on the ground and just be your connection to the earth yep. can really be, be helpful for people. We've got a lot of great questions here and, and they're, they're coming in. Uh, next question about herpes. Can herpes be treated with medication? Jason, what do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a couple different uh, ways that we look at that. So, so herpes, uh, the virus uh, causes cold sores. Um, that can absolutely be treated with medication, especially if someone typically has um, the early symptoms of burning um, and can tell that that's coming on. There's medication to take that will prevent that from becoming a full-on cold sore. Um, similarly, 
with uh, genital herpes, there, there's uh, medicines, uh, the, the same medicines essentially, uh, that can help suppress that um, if there is an outbreak. Um, and sometimes people will take that medication you know, long term, every, every day, just to keep that um, suppressed. So yeah, absolutely, there's medication for that, um, and definitely worth talking to your your provider about that. Jason, what causes herpes, and can you get rid of it? Um, so it is a virus, the herpes virus. Uh, we, we've learned a lot about viruses this year with the with the coronavirus. Um, but yeah, it's a similar uh, similar type of uh, issue in that uh, you you pick that up from somewhere. Um, it's typically contact, uh, and so. Um, once you've got that virus in your system, uh, we don't typically think of it being curable. No, it, it does stick around. Yeah, but at least thankfully there's medication that can help suppress it from, from coming back. You know, same family as in herpes zoster that causes shingles mm -hmm. too. Um, and and, and uh, thankfully now we've got a vaccine that, to help prevent shingles. So. Um, Here's a question, John. What could cause a sharp pain in the left front of my abdomen? Um, can be can be kind of a wide range there. I think part of it is always was there physical activity. So if it's depending if it's very superficial, or you can push and make that hurt. I, I would first think of something: do we strain or pull a muscle? Do we do activities? Typically, you would have probably done something to realize that, but not always. Um, Left side of the abdomen tends to be more, well, I guess it depends on male or female, but for, for both, uh, obviously, colon-type issues. And so diverticulitis um, is one that can pop up as folks get older. Um, obviously, for women, there's ovarian or menstrual gynecologic-type issues are a potential as well. And so... Um, so it can be really a wide range of things. So it kind of doubles in the details. What are the things that make it better, things that make it worse, um, timing, um, position change, that type of thing. So uh, I usually tell folks if it's, you know, you can kind of give it some time typically, but if it's not getting better, obviously, depending on how excruciating, whether it's a trip to your physician or to the emergency room. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've even had patient present with left-sided abdominal pain that end up being a heart attack, you mm -hmm. know, so you never know. Yep. And you gotta, gotta look into it. Uh, this 73-year-old uh, caller asks, what causes subcutaneous, so under the skin, blood clots, splotches in the arms and hands when they are bumped into things or experience minor injury? Jason, have you seen people with that? Yes, all the time. Uh, it is a common complaint. Um, and you know what, what I tell people is, um, as we as we get older, things don't work quite as well, um, and, and we get a little bit more fragile. And those small uh, blood vessels under our skin, the capillaries, um, are also more fragile. And it doesn't take much sometimes to break those open and have a small amount of blood leak into that top layer of the skin and cause that bruise that we see. Um, they're not typically painful or dangerous. They're, they're, they're not a blood clot that's gonna travel somewhere and, and cause problems. Um, they're, they're mostly cosmetic, but they, they can be pretty dramatic. Yeah, um, you know, and then if they, you know, of course, if they're taking aspirin or a blood thinner, of course, that can increase your risk of bleeding too. Um, along those same lines, Jason, as someone gets older, this person asks what, what causes their imbalance problem and what can they do to help? Yeah, that is a, a challenge we run into a lot. Um, so uh, there's, there's any number of things. Um, you know, some of it is that we're not uh, typically as active as we used to be when we're younger. Um, you can think back to when we, when we were kids and, and at least I was jumping off rocks and, and running around um, you know, like, like little boys do. Um, as we grow up and uh, um, realize, I guess, we, we, we don't do that as adults, uh, we don't challenge our, our balance as much, so we don't practice uh, our balance. Um, and, and then just again, as we, as we age, um, our reflexes aren't as brisk, our muscles don't react as quickly. Um, it's unfortunately part of that, that process of getting older. Um, there are things we can do to help with that, for sure. Uh, physical therapy often is beneficial to strengthen any weaknesses or um, imbalances in strength that we may have. 
Um, and then of course, uh, using caution when we get up and, and common sense. Yeah, I've definitely seen more so this year than other years, but every year after in the spring when you know we're getting out of hibernation and if we've been at home a lot, and a lot of people have been home a lot now because of uh, COVID, uh, you know, we haven't been moving around as much, yeah. walking around as much, and it can it can be hard on a person's just whole body, and 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 Definitely. so getting that therapy, getting going, getting active again, yeah. can really be helpful. Uh, this person asks, can amlodipine increase blood glucose levels? John, have you ever heard of that? Not typically. It definitely causes peripheral edema or swelling in the lower extremities is mm -hmm. is very common with that one. But um, uh, and we had that question come up. I quick looked at my reference quick and it's not listed as a typical or potential side effect. I've kind of learned I'd never say never, but I'd go looking for other causes in that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, this person was recently diagnosed with hereditary hemochromatosis. What do I need to know about it and how will this impact my life, John? <laughs> well, um, so I would assume if they've obviously diagnosed it, they've done some testing. So whether that, how in depth that gets, whether that's with your primary physician or sometimes we'll have folks see a hematologist. Um, some of it depends on what family histories are out there. Um, some of that basically has to do with how your body handles iron. And so some of that is um, actually, um, I say donating or, you know, it would be bloodletting from, uh, from time to time to kind of counteract that is typically, and people typically do well with it. So compared to other blood disorders and maybe uh, have cancer type implications. Uh, it's relatively benign, but it is something that will need to be followed the rest of their life. So yeah. sometimes some dietary changes and things may be in order in that in that as well. And of course, if that you know if it, that that iron keeps building up, can damage the liver. It yeah. becomes a liver disease, and mm -hmm. they might see a liver specialist too. But uh, um, yeah, just one of those things we look for. You usually don't see, but it it's From time out to there. time. Yep. 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 This person asks, what could cause a toenail to turn black? No trauma has occurred. Jason, uh, a black toenail, what are you thinking? Um, well, it certainly would be helpful to see that, but uh, yeah, without uh, being able to see it, I would say that can be still micro traumas, um, shoes that maybe are a little too snug and that nail is butting up against the end of the shoe um, we see that in our um, elite athletes or, or folks that will run, you know, marathons or, or long races. Um, you know, they don't typically have something fall on their toenail, but there is that that repeated micro trauma. Um, so if it's if it's black and it looks like that's uh, blood under the nail, that would be my suspicion. Um, certainly, depending on the size of that, you would want to worry about. You know, if that uh, looks like a mole or uh, something that would be concerning for melanoma, that would need to be evaluated as well. Um, those are probably the main things that come to mind. So. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, un unfortunately, you know, it's very unusual and rarely the case. But yeah, like you said, melanoma is a, a, the type of skin cancer that we want to uh, catch early and do something about if that is. So another reason to get it, get it looked into. Um, this person asked about the long-term effects of taking metformin. John, your thoughts on metformin? As with any medication, there's risk-benefit discussion that should be had with your provider. And so in the grand scheme of things, uh, given the, assuming it long-term use is usually going to be in diabetes. Um, we occasionally will use it for polycystic ovary and other, other type of situations occasionally. But typically it's going to be for diabetes and, and you have to run that, that risk benefit uh, mindset. We definitely know what the complications of diabetes are, whether it's uh, vascular, neuropathic, uh, kidney, renal um, type issues. And so um, metformin is, is typically one of the few meds most people agree is still the first line to treat diabetes and basically use it until it's not effective and you need insulin or otherwise. And so, so I, I think for the vast majority of times that risk benefit ratio is going to tip towards taking it long term. Um, now, um, certainly some people have side effects. Um, I have GI is a common one, and so it's kind of a, I have some people that tolerate one, but don't two. Sometimes they'll tolerate yeah. three, not four. They get um, diarrhea. Yep, diarrhea for, you know, and so I have some that just don't tolerate it. Um, also in renal function, if, if renal function, uh, I'm comfortable it really does not cause renal issues, but if your kidneys are taking a hit and aren't fully functional, it can be harmful in that way too, so we'll cut back on it. So it's, that again, that balance and that, that discussion looking at the whole picture to say, okay, why are we on it in the first place? Um, 
Um, some people, some women will use it for cycling issues if they have some infertility issues or some benefits there. So there's some other things we may not be talking long term, but in a general general scheme, it's thought to be be a benefit. Right, definitely can help decrease the risk of all those possible complications with diabetes. Yep. Um, sometimes even no matter how controlled or not the blood the diabetes is, the more controlled the better. But it, but the fact if you're on metformin can decrease your risk of those complications. Absolutely. We have come a long way since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, but it was a bumpy road and there's still a long way to go. Prairie Doc reporter Carter Schmidt spoke with Averis Dr. David Basil to recap the last year and the importance of vaccination. Over the last year, we've had many ups and downs with COVID. Avera has seen over 5,000 hospitalizations and over 500 deaths uh, related to COVID. These peaked in November and fortunately started coming back down pretty steadily throughout uh, December and January, just in time for us to shift some workers from caring for patients in the hospital to getting folks vaccinated. Our vaccination efforts across our region have been going splendidly. We are way ahead of where we thought we would be on the number of people that are vaccinated at this point. We have over 30% of the population in our region that have had at least one dose of vaccination at this time. Numbers continued to decrease through the early spring, and we were all starting to feel pretty good uh, that we were well on our way back to normal. However, we have seen a disturbing trend now in the last uh, several weeks. Hospitalizations have now again doubled from their low in early March, and we see case rates continuing to rise again. This is likely due to several factors. Uh, first off, we are seeing variants that are coming into our region. Variants are mutations of the spike protein, those outer uh, part of the virus that allow it to spread faster and potentially even be more severe illness. We are seeing that the UK variant particularly is becoming the dominant strain in our area. Even more concerning, we are seeing uh, sporadic cases of South African variant and the new California variant as well come in, which have some partial escape from immunity and need even higher concentrations of antibodies to be able to successfully fight them off. Currently across the VARES system, we have about 40 individuals that are hospitalized. We dropped down to a low of about 17 uh, in early March. We've had over 5,000 individuals that we've uh, monitored at home in addition to the 5,000 hospitalizations we've had, including at, at several hundred at one time that we've had on home oxygen. We are such a great place compared to where we'd been a few weeks, a few years ago, if this had happened, we were unable to monitor these patients at home with all the telemedicine ca capability that we have now. We would have had to hospitalize those individuals and that would have made this whole situation so much worse. So the data is showing that COVID vaccination reduces the likelihood you can spread it to others. It does not eliminate it, but so it's still important to continue masking efforts in public because you never know who has not been vaccinated or who might be immunosuppressed that you could still spread this disease. And we're seeing it spread faster again. So it's still important when you're in public to continue those efforts. Together, we can win this and beat back COVID once again. And if you want to get back to normal, I mean, what is the, when people can get that vaccine and have that opportunity to do so, why is it so important that they do that? Yeah, we all want to get back to normal just as quickly as possible. And we saw signs of that. The CDC started relaxing uh, some of the regulations, started allowing vaccinated individuals to start coming together. So we saw signs of opening back up. Now with the variants coming, I don't anticipate we'll see further opening until we can get those variants back under control again. And, and the only way we're going to do that is to get even more people vaccinated and get up to that herd immunity concept. Yes, it would seem that the vaccine is, is will will be the ticket to get us back to normal. I think, and uh, not soon enough. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, cases have been on the rise a little bit lately, and we are seeing more cases in, in here in Brookings anyway. Um, and uh, and thankfully, ne starting next week, you know everyone can Running get up. the shot, all adults, yep. you yep. know, 16 or 18 and older. Um, and so go ahead and uh, and and go pursue that. Yes. Highly recommend it. 
Um, I think we'll we'll do the COVID questions now that Sounds have come good. in. And uh, uh, so, John, does uh, interstitial lung disease lead to worse things? Can it be worsened by COVID? So I guess if I'm understanding it correctly, assuming somebody with under interstitial lung I disease, suppose maybe just, it, it would increase yeah. the risk of COVID. I would imagine. Um, I mean, certainly, it, yeah, anybody with lung disease, whether it's been asthma, emphysema, COPD, um, a couple early on that I had that were in the hospital that were young were vapors. Um, so like yeah. we saw with some of the things earlier last year, with some of the issues with the products, um, certainly um, anytime you're putting those inhalants and that irritant in the lung, it's going to make it worse. You know, fortunately, the folks that have recovered, that have done well, and obviously we have all had cases that haven't gone well, but those that have recovered um, in conversations with Dr. Sene, our local pulmonologist, most everyone recovers from the COVID inflammation at some point. Now, that may take three to six months from the, from the lung perspective, but most everyone gets back to their baseline. No, not going to get better, but most people do hopefully get better if, unfortunately, some obviously haven't survived if it set off that ARDS or inflammatory pathway, but um, but I, from what I've heard from him, particularly if people had normal lungs going in, if they ended up with a severe case and significant lung disease, and even one of my partners really struggled for a while, it does come back, but it may be a prolonged three to six to nine months or more. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it just another example of, you know, the vaccine may be a little bit new, but it's been studied in thousands and now millions of people. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, if you're worried about it being a experiment with the vaccine, it's been studied and millions of people have it. And the bigger experiment is what is that va virus going to do yeah. to a person? And that's so. been the hard part is it's just not been predictable. You know, you can't, yeah. you know, we recently lost a young 50 something year old man who was yeah. healthy and, uh, and it broke a lot of hearts, but got a lot of attention too. Of there was no reason he should have passed away. And we know the risk factors of elderly and, and some of those others, but yeah. we can't always predict. So, you know, I, I we know what the virus is doing to folks and we know that people are, are dying from it. So I do think at the end of the day, um, the vaccine is is no doubt safe in my mind. So. Is there a necessary, is it necessary to have a certain amount of time between getting a COVID vaccine and getting the shingles uh, vaccine? Jason, what are you recommending for patients as far as COVID vaccine and other vaccinations? Right, yeah, so the recommendation uh, is to have no other immunizations in the two weeks prior or the two weeks following uh, a COVID vaccine. Um, I think, and, and I, I, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's any known issue necessarily with that. I think it's more just to keep our data clean about the COVID vaccines and, and if someone would have a reaction, uh, we would know that it was from the vaccines and not a combination. Um, we often give vaccines together in our in our you know, pediatric populations. So typically we wouldn't necessarily be concerned about vaccines together. Um, but I think in this case, it's more just to, to keep that data pure and if there were a reaction. Sure. This caller asked, Jason, uh, this, uh, it says, my husband and I received a COVID-19 treatment a while ago that the nurses referred to as BAM. Bamlanivimab, say that three <laughs> times fast, right? right. It's that, that uh, monoclonal antibody infusion. And we're told to wait to get their COVID vaccines because they already had antibodies. They're asking, would it be safe to schedule our vaccines even though we are still within three months of having the transfusion? What are you recommending there, Jason? Uh, so I guess the, the question is safe. Uh, would it be safe? Um, probably. Uh, but the concern would be, will it be effective? And, and that's the issue is that it may not be effective uh, or as effective as we would uh, expect. So um, so it is definitely recommended to, to wait that full three months. Right. Yeah, we want the vaccine to be fully protective and and uh, we'd hate for that to interfere. And for most folks in that period of time, we're considering them protected from the antibody they have from the infection itself. And so, you know, I've not had anybody that has really lost that antibody protection within less than three months. And so I kind of try to reassure them to say in that 90 days, unless you have severe immunodeficiency and you should be talking to a specialist anyway, in that case, probably, um, you're going to have some innate protection from the first infection. So, yeah. So they say, why can't the COVID vaccine be given in pill form? Any other vaccines given orally, John? Um, 
Great question. So um, we have one vaccine that's oral. Well, there's a couple of other odd infectious disease ones, but yeah. um, for the most, the routine ones, um, rotavirus in children is the only one that's oral. Um, some of that has to do with like insulin that has to be given injectable. Your gut first, pay, first phase digestion breaks it down and, and renders it inactive and breaks it down so your body doesn't get the same response. So uh, I would, as you tell patients, I would guarantee if they could put it in a pill form, they would. They're not doing right. it in a shot to be mean. So um, it is a direct way to make sure it's pure and in your system. Um, but unfortunately, they just haven't, technology hasn't figured that one out yet. Yeah. I'm thinking of typhoid, too. Like you said, yeah. other obscure travel yeah, typhoid, ones um, or, yeah. and so on. But this, this caller is a family member in Europe and was advised not to get the vaccine because they are allergic to penicillin. Is there any risk getting the COVID vaccine if the patient is allergic to penicillin, John? Not that I'm aware of. Um, we've had some interesting providers make some interesting recommendations in our community and I had our, our farm D, we have a pharmacist, farm D on staff and the students have kind of reviewed and unless you've had a specific reaction to the, the vaccine itself, there really aren't um, a lot of allergic contraindications that I'm aware of. So if somebody is someone who's had issues with medications, I usually ask the farm D to look those over and see if we're potentially missing something, but there is not a long list of imp complications or reactions with it. So. Right, right. You know, and I'm also thinking penicillin in particular is one where, you know, someone might have had a rash as a baby mm -hmm. and they said they're allergic to penicillin. Yeah. And, and that's actually one that they can grow out of, for lack yeah. of a better term. Yeah. And you can get tested mm -hmm. to see if you have a true penicillin allergy because 80% of them are not true allergies. Yeah. And that's really limiting your ability to get a good antibiotic if needed sometime later. So yep. maybe talking in, about to your doctor or seeing an allergy uh, specialist to get tested for that might not be a bad idea. We do a lot more of that lately. And I think it's probably a good lead in and you can maybe speak to what you're seeing out there, Jason. I, certainly the side effect of the vaccine is a big discussion and you get the yep. Johnson & Johnson one shot or two shots. Um, I, I've seen in my practice, those that have had COVID typically probably feel, have a little more side effect after the first one and yeah. the second one's a little easier. If you have not had it, they usually breeze through the first one because it's the first exposure to your system. Uh, and then the second one sometimes, and that can be as much as 50 or 60%. Um, it can be intense, but it's usually very short lived. Most of my patients have said like 12 hours, you know, maybe it's night sweats, maybe it's body aches, maybe some GI symptoms. But I just tell them they're getting, I joke, they, they're getting their money's worth since they, <laughs> oh, the true and false is done now, right? Yeah. So yeah, they're getting their money's worth um, as far as, uh, as paying for the vaccine, obviously, because you don't have to. But, yeah. um, but it does, um, it is worth it. Yeah. yeah. Along those lines, this caller received the first Moderna shot a few weeks ago, still experiencing headache, muscle pain, and difficulty concentrating. How long will it take for symptoms to subside? Jason, how long have you seen some people with uh, side effects from it? Yeah, I would agree with Dr. McAravey. You certainly have heard uh, patients reporting symptoms, but typically, typically brief um, following their immunizations. That uh, that would certainly be uh, outside of the the norm to have symptoms that late. Uh, would make me wonder if there's something else going on um, other than than that immunization. Uh, certainly could be. Um, I mean that that response that we get that that achiness and chills. That's our immune system doing its job. That's that's how we feel when we're making antibodies. So, um, you know, I kind of like Dr. McAravey. I tell my patients that's a good thing. That means your your body's doing what it's supposed to. Uh, it doesn't feel that great, but um, but yeah, that shouldn't be a, a, a weeks long process. That would I would wonder for a, an, an alternative answer. I might, I might mention we've had more than one person who's gotten the vaccine one day and all of a sudden a day or two later went in and got tested and ended up unfortunately developing COVID at the same time. And so there's a few folks we've encouraged to go get the antigen test because that is not going to be artificially positive because of the vaccine. And so um, we have unfortunately had a few folks that have had that. And unfortunately, those folks sometimes have had very intense couple of weeks because they have the double whammy of the vaccine exposure and, and the virus. And so um, if it seems out of the norm, talk to your provider, have them do a little digging and look, and maybe just unfortunate you have something else going on too. Yeah. And I would add, I, I, I've heard and now seen of someone that had a big red welt on their arm um, and, and that nationwide, there's a f some of those cases getting reported. And sometimes they don't show up for another week or two afterwards and usually mm -hmm. not too painful or maybe they're itchy and stuff they can look worse than they are and it's not harmful and it will go away on its own and it doesn't mean it's a allergic reaction and that and you can still get your second shot 
mm -hmm. um, uh, and maybe just get it in the other arm. So, uh, very good. Uh, anything else you'd want to say about uh, COVID, Jason? Are you guys seeing a few more cases out there right now or, or not? Um, yeah, we're still seeing, uh, just, just like the report earlier said, we were, we were hopeful that the numbers were coming down um, and looked good for a while, but they really plateaued and remained steady. Um, so we're, we're definitely not out of the woods yet. Yeah. We'll, we'll switch to a few more non-COVID questions, just like with the few minutes left here. Are there any alternatives to a full knee replacement for bone-on-bone -bone knee arthritis? John. Um, assuming they've kind of already done the conservative therapy. And so um, our, our therapy group in town, you know, movement is medicine and, and, and you got to get moving and active. And, and sometimes that just completely inhibits it. And so it depends on the level of pain and dysfunction that's there. Um, assuming they've probably done already the standard oral, over the counter anti inflammatories and pain meds, um, steroid injection, the some artificial lubricant type injections. Um, Beyond that, you can get it, the devil's in the details a little bit. There are, you can talk about partial knees, but for the most part, most folks don't qualify for that. And if it's shot, it's, it's shot. And so, um, uh, again, I, I encourage them to do some physical therapy and work on motion and movement and how do you offload that joint a little bit and, and potentially substitute a little bit. But at the end of the day, when it's shot, that yeah. is really kind of your last option and your only option. And I've had some patients that, weren't the best candidate for surgery, didn't want to do surgery, mm -hmm. and they used a brace then, and that got them through That'd be fair. too, yep. so sometimes that can help. Are multivitam multivitamins actually helpful for my health? Jason, do you recommend a multivitamin? Um, so I don't necessarily discourage them, uh, but I don't typically recommend them. Um, you know, most of our uh, diet uh, does cover the, the essential vitamins. We have a lot of fortified uh, foods that have vitamins added to them. Um, there's not really any evidence that they're harmful uh, if, if taken appropriately and, and in the appropriate quantities. Um, so a multivitamin, uh, I usually tell patients plus or minus, um, you know, as long as they're not on a restrictive diet um, where they may potentially be missing some nutrients. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of evidence that those are, those are necessary. Are there some vitamins you do recommend? Yeah, uh, so typically, um, especially for uh, female patients, I uh, recommend calcium and vitamin D for uh, bone health. Um, and then um, I do typically recommend for all my patients uh, over the winter months to take a vitamin D supplement um, just to, to combat some of that vitamin D loss that we get through the long, cold winter. <laughs> Yeah, very good. Well, now we'll cut to our uh, answer for tonight's Prairie Doc Quiz question. It's a true or false question. Um, you may be charged for a COVID-19 vaccination depending upon your insurance. True or false? And the answer is false. According to the CDC, the federal government is providing the vaccine free of charge to all people living in the United States, regardless of their immigration or health status. The winner of tonight's quiz is Russ Brandt from Aberdeen, South Dakota. Thank you, Russ, for participating, and a book will be in the mail soon. We'll be right back after this. Welcome to your Prairie Doc Library at www.prairiedoc.org. Wherever you live or travel, you and your family can enjoy free and easy access 24 hours a day. Search for a specific topic, browse through the television shows, radio programs, and blog page. You, your family, and friends around the world can learn from physicians and other health professionals answering questions on a variety of medical topics. Visit your Prairie Doc Library today at www.prairiedoc.org. The patient knew something was wrong. After appointments with several specialists, multiple scans and tests, she was given a diagnosis. Still, she felt certain something was not right. I sat down with her and listened. We repeated a test she had a year prior, and this time the test garnered a different result. There was a tumor growing. She listened to her gut, she persisted, and with an accurate diagnosis, she got the medical care she needed. Usually, it doesn't help to repeat a medical test. Nine times out of 10, the result is the same. However, if, as a patient, you get that feeling that something is amiss, 
Seek out answers and find someone who will listen. That does not mean you need every possible test. Tests are costly. They are only a tool, and using the wrong tool can cause more harm than good. Physicians are adeptly trained in the application of the tools of medicine. Throughout college, four years of medical school, and another three or more years of residency training, an MD or DO invests over 10 to 15,000 clinical hours while learning the art of medicine. Ideally, as physicians gain experience and confidence, we learn to discern when a test is needed and how to avoid an unnecessary test. Most importantly, a well-trained physician learns that listening to the patient history is a more powerful tool than any test. The history is the story of the patient's current and past symptoms as told by the patient. It does not come from the chart, is not in a textbook, and cannot be determined by a blood test or a CT scan. To obtain it, a physician must listen. Unfortunately, physicians often interrupt a patient within the first 10 to 15 seconds of the visit. Pressures from time, from documentation, from insurance companies, and from the next patient that is waiting can contribute to the detriment of the interview. However, with careful listening and guidance from the physician, the patient will frequently provide all that is needed to reach an accurate diagnosis. We can all learn more by listening, whether listening to our bodies, our family, our friends, or even our adversaries, it is time well spent. When we take the time to listen, we are one step closer to the truth. You'll feel it in your gut. A big Thank you to our guests, Dr. Jason Knutson and Dr. John McAravey for volunteering their time to help us answer all your great questions. If you would like more information about this program or to see and hear more episodes of this program, please like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube or visit us at prairiedoc.org. And be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever you get your podcasts. That does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. is one of our most important senses. Sadly, we often don't think of eye care unless something goes wrong. Eyes, a window to your health. Next time, On Call with the Prairie Doc. Useful, science-based health information delivered in a respectful and compassionate manner. This is what we all receive from the Prairie Docs. Hello, my name is Dave Hank, and I serve on the board of the Healing Words Foundation. Our organization works to build financial support for Prairie Doc programs. We thank our four Prairie Docs and the many health providers who volunteer their time to answer our health questions. However, significant funding is required to produce and distribute video, radio, and print programs throughout the region. Your donations can help us continue the Prairie Doc legacy. On behalf of the Healing Words Foundation Board, please join us in our mission. Go to prairiedoc.org and click the donate button today. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, 
Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, First Bank and Trust, South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson and Visitant, Monument Health, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society, Pierre District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Urology Specialists, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. 